Değerli konuklarımız aranın ardından şimdi konuk konuşmacımız Catherine Rogers sunumunu gerçekleştirecek. Uluslararası ticari tahkimde etik konusunda uluslararası tanınırlığa sahip olan ve Queen Mary Üniversitesi e, Tahkim ve Etik e, Enstitüsü'nün eş başkanı olan Catherine Rogers konuk konuşmacı olarak bugün aramızda. Kendisini sunmak ee, sizlere tanıtmak üzere Erdem Erdem kurucu ortağı aynı zamanda Yüksek İstişare Kurulu üyemiz Profesör Doktor Ercüment Erdem'i ve Sayın Catherine Rogers'ı e, sahneye davet ediyorum. Böyle geçin. E, mikrofon takılırken tekrar bir hatırlatma yapmış olayım. Soru yöneltmek isteyen e, değerli katılımcılarımız, e, organizasyon firmamızda görevli olan arkadaşlarımıza, bu mavi kravatlı özellikle arkadaşlarımıza, kağıda isimlerini, e, soy isimlerini ve sorularını yazarak verebilirler. E, oturumun sonuna doğru değil, en başından itibaren verebilirsiniz. E, Ercüment Bey e, sorularınızı aldıktan sonra, ee, okuyup e, süreci devam ettirecek. Çok teşekkürler. Değerli konuklar, İstanbul Tahkim Derneği'nin yönetim kurulu üyeleri ve değerli başkanı, kıymetli hocalarım, kıymetli e, tahkim dostları, hepiniz bugünkü etkinliğe hoş geldiniz. İstanbul Tahkim Derneği, e, Mehmet Bey'in açılış konuşmasında belirttiği gibi, uzunca bir hazırlık sürecinin sonunda kuruldu ve bugün önemli bir etkinliğe de ev sahibi yapıyor. Emeği geçen herkesi kutluyorum ve teşekkür ediyorum. Bu oturumda ele alacağımız konu etik ve konunun gerçek bir uzmanıyla beraber olmanın da mutluluğu içindeyiz. Profesör Rogers hem Queen Mary'de hem de Penn Üniversitesi'nde dersler veriyor neredeyse etik alanında yazılmış tüm önemli makale ve eserlerin müellifi, 2014 yılında kaleme aldığı Oxford yayınlarından çıkan çok önemli bir kitabı var. E, merak edenler için mutlaka bir göz atılmasını öneririm. Çok ufuk açıcı. Ben kitap hakkındaki yorumları da okudum. Ve gerçekten etkilendiğimi söylemek isterim. Onun için e, bu e, oturumda çok şey öğreneceğimizden eminim. Şimdi bugün İstanbul Tahkim Derneği'nin hakemlere yönelik etik kurallarını ele almak üzere toplanıyoruz. İstanbul Tahkim Derneği fevkalade önemli bir işe imza attı. Ama... Etik deyince bunu aslında hakemlerle sınırlamamamız lazım. Çünkü tahkim pek çok paydaşın içinde bulunduğu bir bütün. Tabii ki başrolde belki hakemler var. Ama en az hakemler kadar önemli olan avukatlar var. Tahkim kurumları var. Tahkim sürecine katılan uzman tanıklar var. Hatta hatta tahkimi finanse eden kuruluşlar var. Bunların hepsinin tahkimdeki etiğe ilişkin değişik sorumlulukları var. Tahkim kurallarına baktığımız zaman ki bugün sizlere dağıtılan broşürde karşılaştırmalı bir çalışma da göreceksiniz. Kimi kurallarda daha uzun, kimi kurallarda daha kısa etik temelli ilkeler veya kurallar var. Demek ki burada daha henüz e, ne ulusal bazda ne uluslararası bazda bir 
konsensüs veya bir fikir birliği de sağlayamamış durumdayız. Hiç kuşkusuz bütün bu tahkimde yer alan paydaşlar ait oldukları kültürlerden veya geldikleri coğrafyadan çok önemli ölçüde etkileniyorlar. Bu etki sahip oldukları etik değerleri de etkiliyor. Bütün bunları ve daha da fazlasını Profesör Rogers'ın şimdiki sunumundan öğreneceğiz. Ben sözü kendisine bırakıyorum. Sorular için gerekli açıklama yapıldı. Sorularınızı bekliyorum. Profesör Rogers. Yes. Whatever you want. Okay, let's go over to the podium. So first, let me thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. It was truly an honor. Uh, and I have to say, I, I have been, it's a particularly busy time for me. I flew in late last night from London. I have to leave tomorrow, unfortunately, for Doha. I wouldn't have been able to come, or wouldn't have been able to find time to come, except for the gracious invitation uh, that was actually conveyed to me by a former student, Hayati. I also am uh, particularly delighted to be here because I have several former students in the audience, uh, both from Queen Mary and from Penn State. Uh, and it's just a true honor to be able to come here and see see them in as they are working to grow the arbitration community that they've written about and studied with me uh, in another place. So with that, let me start. I want to actually start with a thought experiment um, and go back, because now we all take for granted that international arbitration exists and that it's, of course it exists, it has to exist, it's, it's really important. But it's not so obvious that it ever could come into being. And, and to start this uh, thought experiment, I want to take the analogy or the metaphor of the bumblebee. So we all know that the bumblebee flies. We've seen them. We know that they're very important for cross-pollinizing uh, our flowers and our uh, produce. But it's not at all obvious to scientists why they should fly. In fact, until about 30 years ago, if you asked a physicist, they would say it's impossible that the bumblebee can fly. They couldn't explain it. They said their bodies are too heavy, their wings are too small for them to fly. And if you ask the aeronautics engineers, they would also say, it's impossible to fly. They can't fly. Their, their wings, they flap too slowly, and they're a bit erratic. They, they shouldn't be able to fly. But somehow they do. And it was actually just in the last 30 years, with some experiments in China using lasers and mirrors, they were actually able to explain why is it, how is it, that a bumblebee can fly? Well, I would suggest the same thing is true about international arbitration. So let's all suppose for a moment that we don't know it exists, and someone comes and says, I'm going to introduce a new form of dispute resolution. Now, we're going to replace national courts, okay? But instead of replacing them with a permanent body, with judges who are appointed by the government, who have nice robes, who sit in uh, established courtrooms with a bailiff and a flag and all of these symbols that we know stand for justice. We're going to uh, put them in conference rooms in random places around the world. Instead of government uh, issued and ordained rules of civil procedure and of evidence, we're going to have some flexible rules that are drafted by, we'll call them arbitral institutions. And we're going to organize this whole thing with no appellate review, no substantive review of the decision makers. We'll call them arbitrators. And this whole project, this whole global system, will be organized through what's effectively a two-page document. Then we'll call it a convention. Maybe we'll sign it in New York. Now, if I proposed this to you, you would probably say, like people used to say about the bumblebee, it couldn't possibly work. It defies gravity in a way that we wouldn't predict would be possible. But in fact, international arbitration has done just that, against all intuitions about what's necessary for a dispute resolution system. Against all historical conventions, we have today a remarkably successful system that exists globally, and that, as we're seeing today, uh, in recent years, pulls in more and more new countries and new players. 
So we're here today to celebrate what I think are new innovations in Istanbul and in Turkey, but in many ways they are the culmination of centuries uh, of history. Now we're going to shift from the bumblebee metaphor to another metaphor, to the building. If you are trying to build a new structure, a new building, a lot of people think, okay, I want this to be a beautiful building. I'm going to think about the arches and we want some wonderful uh, stained glass windows and we want to have some beautiful carpets. Uh, and you think about all the de decorative aspects of this building. But as we all know, what a building needs to be strong and sustainable are important strong cornerstones and you need four of them. Uh, and it seems to me that the, excuse me, that the organizers of the of the uh, of ISCA and of ISTA uh, have actually thought very carefully about what these cornerstones need to be. And some of them we've heard alluded to already in the first panel, and some of them will be brought up later uh, in the in the subsequent panels. But one of the starting points, clearly, when you are thinking of what will lead to the success of this building of international arbitration here in Turkey, is Istanbul itself. Uh, as Napoleon once said, I think it's probably a familiar phrase to everyone in the room, uh, if all of the planet were one state, Istanbul would be its capital. Uh, and that goes it, it, not just as a sort of metaphor, but it has in fact been the capital of so many empires excuse me, of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and then the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it is, as we all know, the crossroads between Europe and the Middle East. It is, uh, also has an incredible history of commerce, uh, not just of thriving commerce domestically, but of international commerce and some of the most exotic uh, and important goods. <clears throat> excuse me, so a place that is receptive to international commerce, that is a gateway for international uh, communication among different cultures and different peoples is an essential starting point for a successful arbitral uh, regime. A second, and I think that's something we've already heard quite a bit about and we'll hear more about, uh, is you have to have institutional support. So one of the things, again, even if arbitration has existed for a long time historically in Turkey, we've seen some really important new revolutions in terms of a new arbitration law based on the model law and sort of the international gold standards. We're seeing also uh, a new institution created relatively recently, uh, coming into being in 2015, and, uh, and in 2000, um, and even more recently, uh, ISTA and its code of ethics. One of the things that is, I think, so important about the third cornerstone, ISTA and its code of ethics, is that it seems to be have been intuitive to the creators of this, uh, the builders of this regime, um, that as was said earlier by I believe Elliot, they're in the trust. This, it, arbitration is in the trust business. You aren't going to attract people to take the challenge, to take the risk of submitting a dispute to this and uh, this uh, process that has no buildings, that has no judges in formal roles, robes, that doesn't have the imprinter of the state, but instead has somehow the implicit support of the state, unless you can create trust. And one of the ways you create trust is by broadcasting through something like a code of ethics, uh, the, that this is an organization that takes seriously the integrity of the people who are making the decisions. Now, as was mentioned already, and I'll come back to in a moment, is not just the integrity of the arbitrators, but obviously those are the most important ones to start with uh, in terms of demonstrating and articulating the ethical standards. Why? Because in a system that doesn't have established courtrooms and is not backed by a bailiff or the police force that a court has, it is actually the integrity of the arbitrators that are the most visible form, the most visible means of assuring justice. If you don't have the integrity of the arbitrators, you can't have a sense of confidence in the system. And even if we would like to think that anyone who's drawn to being an arbitrator must do so with a sense of a commitment to justice and integrity, how do we know that that's the case? How can we measure that? How can we understand that that's their commitment? This is a particularly difficult question when you have parties coming from different cultures. 
So it, it seems like, well, an arbitrator is an arbitrator is an arbitrator. So we should all understand what it means to be a good and righteous arbitrator, have integrity as an arbitrator. But there are a number of important differences, just to name a few. In Brazil, for example, it's perfectly acceptable. It's even considered and sometimes described as a right of the parties to meet ex parte, to have sometimes extensive ex parte communications with a judge. Now, in many other systems, that's considered absolutely unacceptable. Okay, but what happens if you have arbitrators from one system and the other in the same proceeding? Is it okay to have ex parte communications or not? Well, the new code, which I think we'll be discussing in more detail, also its history and detailed uh, provisions after lunch, but it anticipated that there might be these differences or lack of collective understanding, so it specifically articulates when and on what topics, namely the selection of arbitrators and the appointment of the chair, it's okay for the arbitrators to have ex parte communications uh, with the parties, uh, but in those very limited instances. Another very quite obvious area is when is it okay to have had relationships past or future current with the parties or the or the law firms well the, again this has to be something that is uh, understood collectively not just subjectively determined by the arbitrators and so we see quite normally and is very much the international standard today that the code, the new code that's being introduced, has an obligation of disclosure that the arbitrators have to disclose to the parties and allow the process of challenge if they have such connections. The other very important uh, responsibility that's articulated in the new code is it doesn't just say that they have an obligation to disclose what they know, but it also indicates that they have a duty to investigate to learn what they might not know themselves, but what if they were to learn and were to be disclosed would cause concern and potential for challenge by the parties. Um, so the, I will comment just briefly now on the actual code itself, um, because I know we're going to discuss it in more detail, including its history uh, after lunch. But that brings me to my fourth cornerstone. So the first three cornerstones of building are a strong regime of international arbitration in Istanbul or in, in Turkey is Istanbul as a place, uh, the institutional support and commitment in both the laws and the uh, arbitral institution, and there's more than one here, um, and then a code of ethics to provide some guidance. But that brings me to what I would call the fourth uh, pillar, and that to some extent is everyone in the room here. Uh, I think it's the people. It's the arbitration community um, that supports it, the stakeholders. Uh, and people sometimes ask me, how did you, why did you go into ethics in international arbitration? Uh, I think many people are intrigued by the procedures that run the arbitration, by the laws that run the arbitrations. Uh, to me, it's all about the people. And as was previewed, actually, there are several different categories of stakeholders. The code of ethics focuses on the arbitrators, and they're the ones we usually look at. But of course, there are also counsel, parties. There are new players, like third-party funders, and players that have been there for a while but are getting increased in tension and are taking on a new role, like expert witnesses or even fact witnesses, tribunal secretaries. Arbitral institutions themselves are being seen as important actors in innovation, as well as arbitral associations, um, such as ISTA, or uh, arbitral uh, institutes, which are not necessarily administering arbitrations, but have an important role to play in developing policy, in providing thought leadership. Um, so these, these various stakeholders come together uh, and form the arbitration community. One of the things that's particularly important is how does this community both conduct itself and integrate with the rest of the international arbitration community? Um, so one of the things that was mentioned by Orzan Diran in his comments is that it needs to be a meritocracy, right? We're looking for both among arbitrators, counsel, uh, and experts, and institutions, uh, that they are selected and they thrive because they are demonstrated to be expert, committed to excellence, uh, and providing uh, services that are responsive to the party's needs. 
One of the challenges in creating a meritocracy is that you have a lot of competition, which is healthy. Uh, so as Istanbul continues to grow and thrive as a center for international arbitration, it will be both comparing itself and trying to exceed, uh, in, ex, to, ex, ex, to excel beyond, excuse me, some potential competitors um, in many different ways. Uh, it will also be uh, engaging in this process in the kind of comparative analysis that has led to the creation of the, of the Code of Ethics. And again, I commend to you very much the booklet that provides uh, a summary of all the different codes that came before, that provided the footstools, the steps up to the code that was developed, because they provide very interesting background. Uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing in some of the background how the uh, how ISTA sought to build on, to stand on the shoulders of others that have come before it in developing codes, because it both has a number of critical cornerstone provisions, but it also innovates beyond those um, to provide some of its own unique approaches. So in addition to uh, the individual people and entities that are involved in this, creating this community, how do, they, how do they come together? I would say there are a couple of really important ways one, uh, which is already, I think, present here, as I understand, uh, a good percentage of the uh, people in the audience are students. Can we see how many students? Oh, wow. Okay, yes. Uh, so lots and lots of students. Uh, so I will commend them all to you. These are the future, right, of international arbitration. I assume they're here because they're studying international arbitration in the schools. Um, many of you might go abroad to do an LLM. Uh, to write a dissertation to try establishing your name as a future arbitration practitioner or arbitrator. In doing so, I would commend you to take the example that ISTA has sent by doing your homework, committing to excellence, committing to integrity, um, and committing to building your own reputation through those processes. Um, the, uh, one thing that is unique and that I love about international arbitration is unlike lawyers who go appear in a court system, we are, as I like to say, the custodians of our own regime. International arbitration only gets better, is only reliable, if the people who uh, represent the parties, the people who represent the institutions, the arbitrators themselves, uh, take that ob obligation seriously. And I'll give you a few examples. So there are instances of uh, some very celebrated instances, celebrated or uh, might be a, is, is a gentle euphemism, uh, of instances of, of alleged misconduct by arbitrators, by counsel, um, behaving badly. And my um, response to that is always, the last thing you should do, either for your client or your institution or for your career as an arbitrator, is take the shortcut. It oftentimes looks easier to not disclose something that should be disclosed, to do something a little sneaky to get an advantage, a short-term advantage over the other side in your arbitration strategy, um, to do some sort of so-called dirty trick uh, to sort of get an, a, an unfair advantage. The problem with those kinds of uh, short-term advantages is they undermine the long-term best interest of international arbitration. Once again, this is an institution that defies gravity. It's not supposed to be as successful as it is. It doesn't make sense if you explain it to someone on the outside. What makes it make sense and what makes it successful is that the custodians of international arbitration have taken on themselves to, uh, to build the system and to commit to strengthening it on an individual basis. And that doesn't just mean creating the code. Uh, but also seeking to adhere to it, to taking a long-term collective self-interest uh, in building this institution rather than a short-term individualized self-interest. Um, um, with that, I think what I would like to do is uh, give the opportunity for questions on some of these things because I don't want to go too much into the details of the code, which I think other people are more suited to introduce uh, in the subsequent panels. But what I'd like to do is to invite questions uh, and uh, comments uh, on these topics that we can both perhaps respond to.
Profesör Rogers'a bu değerli konuşması için çok teşekkür ederiz. Şu noktaların altını çizdi. Dedi ki tahkimin başarılı olabilmesi için sağlam temellere oturması lazım. Bu açıdan kurumsal desteğe de ihtiyaç var. Bu kurumsal destekte İSTA gibi derneklerin rolü de büyük. Hakemlerin e, rolüne e, vurgu yaptı. E, hakemlerin görünür olmaları onların e, dürüstlüğü, şeffaflığı e, açısından çok tahkime duyulan güven açısından çok önemli sonuçlar doğuruyor. Ama işimiz sadece hakemlerle sınırlı değil. Tahkime katılan tüm tarafların e, ki bunların içinde hakem e, kurulunun sekreteryasından derneklere kadar çok geniş bir yelpazeye do, e, değindi. Tabii ki tahkim camiasında bir rekabet olduğundan söz etti. Hem kurumlar arasında hem dernekler arasında. Bu rekabetin de e, sağlıklı bir şekilde olmasını arzu etti ve bence çok önemli bir şeyin altını vurguladı. Tahkimi yaşatmak ve sürdürmek istiyorsak bunun muhafızları bizleriz. Yani bu tahkimde, bu süreçte yer alan hakem olarak, avukat olarak, dernek olarak, kurum olarak hepimiziz. Onun için bu bilinçte olmamız lazım ve kısa dönemli çıkarımlar için uzun dönemli kazanımları ve sürdürülebilirliği bertaraf etmememiz lazım. Bu önemli tespitleri herhalde birkaç soruyla da süslemek isteriz. Şu ana kadar bana ulaşan bir soru yok ama arkadan bir el görüyorum. Buyurun kendinizi de tanıtarak lütfen. Merhabalar hocam. Avukat Yavuz Mavioğlu. First the moderator Professor Erdem mentioned that the rules of ethics haven't been unified yet. There are no universal rules of ethics for arbitrators available. And then Professor Rogers mentioned that there are legal uh, cultural differences affecting uh, legal outcomes, let's say, and uh, also uh, variances of rules. So the question is, do we actually need universal rules of ethics applicable for all arbitrators some, at some level? Is that a target that we should be going for? And how flexible should be when receiving these legal cultural differences from region to region, for instance, these ex parte communications that you referred to, which might be uh, really problematic in uh, some regions compared to others. So what's your comments on those? So, so first, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a really uh, very intelligent uh, question, right? Is uh, we need to have some harmonization, uh, but also there are some differences. Where, how do we draw the line? Uh, and I think that the, the difficulty there is to some extent probably less so uh, with arbitrators uh, in the sense that we need probably greater harmonization than we might tolerate with, as Elliot spoke earlier, uh, about council ethics. With arbitrators, I think the core concerns are we have to have a core of ethics that are going to um, ensure the integrity of the process in a way that is uh, universally understood while not uh, precluding the possibility of some uh, differences that may exist regionally. Let me give you a couple of other differences that might be important regionally. So in Asia, in China, in, uh, uh, in Japan, also in Germany and some other civil law systems, uh, judges actually, and I have to admit I don't know the rule in Turkey, someone can tell me, but judges actually have an, what's considered a professional obligation, it's part of their professional role, to facilitate settlement. Uh, and that's something they're supposed to do during the process. Uh, but there have been challenges in the United States uh, to judges, uh, excuse me, to arbitrators who have tried to facilitate settlement in a way that involves sometimes ex parte communications or communications that are seen as not totally neutral because they're trying to pressure one side or the other to take a more realistic stance. Now, if you have an arbitration between Asian parties or between an Austrian and a German party, I think it's important to allow that kind of flexibility uh, to, you know, something to be acceptable. If you have a 
an arbitration between a, a Peruvian party and a Brazilian party where ex parte communications are considered okay, regionally, it seems to me, there should be some room for that kind of flexible approach to arbitrator ethics. The main concern, though, is that can't be the, the international baseline. I think it has to be an acknowledgement that there are sort of regional differences. And the way to accommodate the distinction, I think, uh, is to have uh, to make it clear and transparent, as we've mentioned, the transparency of different expectations. And some of this can be done uh, through arbitrators in their initial procedural order. Some of it can be done by notes and best practice comments by arbitral institutions if they know there's a regional difference. Uh, and some of it's through educational processes like this conference. When you have discussions about what's acceptable and what's not, uh, people are more can anticipate more where the areas of difference are and ask the right questions rather than being surprised later that their opposing party was speaking to the arbitrator or being disturbed that an arbitrator was engaged in you know, strong efforts to settle a dispute that they, from their cultural background, might think was inappropriate. So I think what you're asking is the, what is the right balance between global and international harmonization and, let's say, respect for regional or cultural differences. And I think the, the balance is always a dynamic one, trying to find the right way, uh, to the right um, trade-off. And the only way to find that is to try and make the differences as well known and express as possible so people can anticipate them and proactively address them rather than responding to them after a problem arises. Perhaps I may have a follow-up question yeah. because Mr. Gessinger has criticized mm -hmm. the IBA rules for that respect. Yeah. What is your thoughts? So, uh, so this is actually uh, uh, an area that we've disagreed about long term. Uh, uh, so, um, on council ethics. So, the IBA has, as you probably know, is in, um, an association. Even though it's called a bar association, it's not really a bar, but it's more—it's a lot more like ISTA, but at a very global level. And they've created a number of harmonized tools, like the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest, which regard arbitrators. More recently, the IBA guidelines on uh, party representatives, which address uh, conduct of counsel or party representatives. And uh, what Elliot was referring to earlier, is there are a number of rules in there, they're called guidelines, that are pretty obvious. Don't present false information to the tribunal. Uh, don't. Uh, don't have ex parte communications with the tribunal, except in limited circumstances. And then there are some that are a little more uh, considered to be closer to, uh, are based on what would be considered a more common law, not just common law, but US, United States legal traditions and legal ethics, mostly those relating to document production. Okay. Discovery. Discovery, exactly. It's, called a, it's a dirty word for many people in international arbitration. But if you don't know, discovery is a way in US litigation that parties exchange information between themselves. And it's very extensive. It can be very expensive also. And there's been a big debate in international arbitration how extensive or narrow this kind of exchange of information should be, especially when we talk about the costs. But it also raises ethical issues. Because, and this is part of what I think uh, the, the Swiss object to most vigorously, in the United States, you have an obligation, because we know there will be extensive document production, if you as an attorney know your client will be in litigation, you have to tell your client to retain, not to destroy, any documents or information that might relate to the litigation, because they might be under an obligation to produce it to the other side. Well, in civil law countries where you don't have an exchange of information, you, you don't have uh, this document retention, and the lawyers don't have to advise their parties keep these documents. Well, the IBA guidelines, this is also, I should say, a very big point of difference in international arbitration, because the IBA rules of evidence, so a different body, uh, anticipates that there'll be some exchange of documents, and particularly US attorneys have been frustrated when they request documents from the other side, the tribunals order documents to be produced from one side, and they're not produced. And so I think the IBA guidelines for party representatives 
tried to resolve this tension between one party wanting the documents, the other side not, by adopting this U.S. ethical rule uh, that our attorneys have an obligation to advise their client not to destroy documents, to retain documents that might need to be exchanged. Well, if you're from a tradition where they don't ever exchange them and you don't think they should be exchanged at all in international arbitration, that strikes you as a, as a problematic rule in the code. Now, I, will, I have to confess, I was on the task force that drafted the uh, guidelines, the IBA guidelines for party representatives. But like many collective works, so just because you happen to be on the task force doesn't mean you personally endorse uh, every single uh, development in it. And my sense is that the IBA guidelines on party, uh, party representation are important also because there is disagreement about them. My sense is that they are a very important first step. They took on a tremendous task, which was to try and understand and articulate harmonized rules. Uh, maybe they got some things wrong, or, or at least things that might change in the future. But it's, uh, it has created a conversation, and a dynamic conversation, uh, about what the right answer is. Yes. I have two more questions okay. from the audience, but I'm advised that we have only three minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> the questions are long, but I try to summarize. The first one is from Bucha Yudre. I don't know if he's or she's among us. Yes, okay. thank you. Why did you need to improve arbitrator intelligence <laughs> and what you suggest law students to take advantage of arbitrator intelligence? So I think we might also have a chance later to speak on this. Thank you for the question because this is a arbitrator intelligence is a, um, my passion project. It's actually a, a one of my most exciting things I do. I, as a, something I love. I will tell you the two-minute version with hopes also that we can come back to it later because I think it's important. It could be important for Turkey. So basically, the way you choose an arbitrator uh, now, you look at their CVs, you create a short list. We heard that earlier. But some of the most important qualities in your arbitrator are not on their CV. Okay? Will this person grant big document production that I want as an American party or not because I'm German and I don't want it? Okay? It's not on their CV. How do you find this out? Well, if you are at a big multinational law firm, you send out an email to all of your network and you say, who has appeared before this arbitrator? Who sat with this arbitrator? And then you call them on their phone and you say, what can you tell me? Are they going to grant me a lot of document production or not? Well, that works really well if you're at a big multinational law firm. But if you are a regional firm, you know, become, you know, coming into your own in international arbitration, you can't call all those people. You don't have that network. So arbitrator intelligence is an effort to try and make the same information that's currently exchanged by telephone try to collect it generally through a questionnaire, we call it the Arbitrator, and question, Arbitrator Intelligence Questionnaire, or AIQ. It's a survey online on our website. And the idea is that after every single arbitration case, people fill out our questionnaire, our survey. We collect that data. We'll then analyze that data and generate Arbitrator Intelligence reports, which will be available to everyone who wants them. Okay? And they can learn about arbitrators case management skills and integrity uh, through these reports without having to make or usually phone calls only to supplement that kind of basic information. Students can get involved. We have all sorts of, we're having a, we're going to be having a campaign in the MENA region, including Turkey, the Middle East and uh, North Africa and Turkey region, starting early in 2019. You can get involved then. Uh, we'll be asking, we'll be calling for volunteers. Um, we think it's an exciting new way to innovate and build a stronger community of international arbitration that has a more level playing field, not only for the repeat players from North America and Europe, but for new players like from Turkey. Thank you. Our last question is uh, coming from Jan Kutschir from Özgün University. Thank you for the question. So, uh, Mr. Shear draw attention to the cooperation between national courts and the arbitral tribunal or arbitrators and ask the following question. Raising awareness regarding international arbitration ethic rules can lead to development of national courts positively. 
I love this question. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's yeah, a brilliant uh, insight. And in fact, I just, uh, with my co-author, Christopher Hosel, we've just been doing an empirical study to try and demonstrate exactly this. So I actually absolutely agree with you. And I'll give you an example. Um, I think both Patricia Shaughnessy and I have been consulting historically in Georgia, uh, which is a neighbor of yours, right, on developing a code of ethics for arbitrators there. They have a similar effort underway. And at a conference, the very first conference when the code was rolled out, introduced to the arbitration community in Tbilisi, a, a judge from the appellate court there stood up and said, uh, you know, if you require such strong uh, ethics of arbitrators, you're going to put pressure on the courts, on the judges also to adopt such strong ethics. It's like, yes, that's actually, it's, that's a, an added benefit, a side benefit. So, and, and, in, and in fact, the same thing I think in Peru recently uh, when I've been there. So, which is counterintuitive. Again, it's, it's really uh, unimaginable, right, that this private process and private arbitrators who commit to integrity can somehow be a good influence on the public model because we think of it flowing the other way. Um, but I think in many regions of the world, they're seeing international arbitration as a way to even strengthen domestic rule of law and improve concepts of justice and access to justice. Um, so great in intuition for such a young person. And if you write me, I'll send you a copy of our article. You can see if you like the way we wrote it up. Çok teşekkür ederiz Profesör Rogers'a bütün bu açıklamaları ve değerli katkıları için. Kendisine teşekkür etmek için, güçlü bir alkış için lütfen bana uyun.